there's a little preamble I'm supposed to read that says, this presentation is being recorded by Missoula Community Access Television as a part of a media assistant grant donated to my organization, the Missoula Art Museum, by MCAT. And for more information, you can visit mcat.org. Welcome, everybody. I'm Brandon Reinches, uh, one of the curators here at MAM. And it's uh, my pleasure to, to welcome uh, not only Ryan Federson, but her family here to the Missoula Art Museum for, I don't know, the third time, I think. We've had uh, a, a series of meetings over the past uh, several years. Ryan initially came to the Missoula Art Museum um, in a, as, as, an, as a person who contributed an artwork uh, in the terrain uh, plateau portfolio, and we started getting familiar with her artwork then, and then she had a, another piece in a, a traveling exhibition that was circulated by the Northwest Museum of Art and Culture, uh, and she had this really fantastic sculpture called Blade Descending Pedestal that was right uh, in the center of the room where Ron's standing with the camera, and it was, it was the piece in the exhibition that included artists from a, across the well, really across the western half of the United States, both mostly in the Northwest, but also the Southwest. And, and her piece was the piece that the whole exhibition kind of revolved around. It, it circum the, the exhibition circumambulated your sculptures. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was really incredible to see the impact that uh, a single piece of sculpture could have on all the school children that come and visit us, the college classes, the general public. People really seem to enjoy that piece. And, and prior to that, we had started talking to Ryan about what this exhibition might look like. We said, we're looking uh, a couple years out. This is the space. Um, we're really in, interested in the interactive nature of your work and in how you really involve us as viewers into the interpretation, creation of your work. And so we, we said, we'd, we'd like to think about that. Uh, if you would, if you would consider works, and we, and she said, well, these are the works that I've done in the past, and this is what I'm working on now, and this is what I might make. And so, as we began that discussion, this exhibition evolved to include the four pieces that you see around the room, and we picked four succinct pieces uh, that dealt with land use and development. Um, from a historical all the way through a contemporary perspective, and just caused us to kind of uh, reevaluate what some of our assumptions were. And it was really an exciting exhibition because the work was being made right up to the last minute, uh, and, and still is being made, as you can see, right up to the last minute. So it's, it's a, an evolving concept, and it's been a really um, wonderful thing to have such a healthy exhibition at the center of the museum. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ryan, and uh, I, what, I, what we envisioned this as, uh, Julie Kajun was not able to make it um, to, with us this morning. She ended up being stuck in Idaho, unfortunately. Uh, she sent a good friend up here, Tammy. Um, but instead of, of having this kind of be as like a, a dialogue, uh, well, no, it's still a dialogue. Let's not throw that out. Um, Rather than have this be a conversation that we observe from a distance, let's make this a conversation between all of us here. And if you have uh, questions or comments about the work as Ryan's uh, explaining it, or if you have something to contribute uh, from, a, from a, a theoretical or philosophical or practical aspect, just chime up and, and throw it throw it at her. She's really good with curveballs, so you can, you can try to knock her off her feet, but you'll, I, I'll be surprised if you succeed. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ryan Federson. Thanks for coming, Ryan. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure working with you over this past, I think, maybe year and a half as we started talking about this exhibition. And... Um, I'm really excited about how everything came together and the way we were able to pull from existing themes and work and kind of transform some of the, the, my existing work in the space. Um, so I'm Ryan Federson. I'm based in Seattle, Washington. I grew up in Wenatchee, Washington. And um, my practice centers around uh, interactive installation art. 
And I also think a lot about the way that um, action, interactivity, and the materiality, specifically the connotations of materials, can support content in a work. I'm always looking to um, build that with each new work, which is why you'll see different types of materials and different types of action and interactivity in all the works that are, that are, that are here today. And that focus really goes back to, um, it goes back to two things. One is the way that I've always felt that when you're making an artwork, you are having a meditation on that subject. No matter how much you think you know about something, when you put in sometimes hundreds of hours thinking about looking at and building, you begin to know a lot more about how you feel about that. You, you understand more about how your ideas were constructed. And I, wanted, I like to give the opportunity for the audience to have some of that experience as opposed to of a passive looking at an image and interpreting its content, having that access point of helping to build that content through your touch, through your participation. Um, and I also, it's based on uh, inspiration from my first indigenous art history class at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, I spent one semester there, and on the very first day of class, the instructor, the late Ed Wop, um, the first thing he said is he informed us that there was no word for art in any indigenous language, no word that had the exact translation. And you know, we're all there for our arts, it's an art college. We're like, well, well, you know, what are you saying we're doing here? <laughs> like, this is what we want to do with our lives, and you're telling us, like, that's not of an indigenous tradition. But what he really wanted us to think about was that there is a Western idea of what art is. And that is, it's usually an object made by a trained, talented, special person that you get to look at. It's on a pedestal, you don't get to touch it. It's on the wall, you don't get to touch it. You may have to pay admission to see it. It's for collectors. It's for institutions of, of power. It's for governments. It's for churches. And that practice was not in indigenous cultures. Art was made to be used. It was made to be touched. It was made to have experiences. It was made to be worn. It was made for communities to talk to each other and to reflect like their culture and values. And that really had a profound effect on the way that I wanted to make art. I always knew that um, I wanted to um, like communicate ideas and try and like do social critique and instigate change through the work that I was doing. But it really made it a very direct way of thinking about like what are my goals, what are my priorities, and what are the tools that I can use to really approach that. And for me, one of the things that really resonated about that was the, the interactivity. That the art isn't something just for outside of you, it's something that you actually get to, get to touch and you actually get to participate in. And so these works in the gallery all kind of show that in different ways. Um, can I see how many people, well, I guess we're on video, so it doesn't really matter how many people were here last night. So I'll, I'll start kind of going through some of the works. Um, the first work I'll talk about is the um, Martha Stewart Cocktails. That is one of the, based on one of the, the oldest works in this exhibition. It is a new installation of a, a previous concept, which I was really excited about the opportunity to really expand upon that prior idea. But um, this was developed when I was still in college. And I was thinking a lot about um, connotations of materials. And the, um, both with like the felt having, makes you think about softness and warmth and femininity. But the act of felting itself is a very feminine activity. And there's often this idea that, bec that when something is so heavily feminized, it becomes then devalued as an art object. And I wanted to um, kind of disrupt that. And the way I thought about that was disrupting it with, by pairing it with, with, with violence. And so um, I started with the felt and started to make this, 
this Molotov cocktail explosion. And in this installation, it's installed in stages. So we see from the first lighting all the way through to the, the splash of, of fire on the wall. And I think this, this piece is, became exceptionally relevant again with our, our recent political climate and the level of misogyny that was kind of hurled at, at women in, during the, this last year. Um, so I kind of see that, that work as being a little bit in tribute to all the women who want to stay nasty, keep fighting, but also be um, lifting up their ideas about femininity uh, along with that, that there doesn't have to be this contrast between the feminine and the powerful or the craft, women's craft or art object. Um, the piece directly behind us is uh, Disconnected Towers, and this piece has been reinstalled with new elements. And this is one of the, probably the last minutes. Um, I kind of got inspired on my last visit, and I told Brandon, by the way, I really want to install something, a new, new piece behind this work um, to really put it into uh, a different context. Um, I live in a neighborhood in Seattle that has experienced a tremendous amount of change in gentrification in the last several years. And if a house is being torn down but is not changing zone, there's no uh, notices that are, that are put up. There is just, there's no public land use. It just comes down. But so I started to notice these giant wooden towers on front lawns. And I thought that they were ominous and almost religious. It almost looked like they were going to tack a witch to it and light it up. And it was just like these haphazard uh, wooden, wooden, wooden sculptures. And then um, over time I started to notice that the house would then come down. And I realized that they were tying off the electricity of one home so they could hold it while they demolished it and then often put in maybe like four um, half a million dollar condos in the place of what had been one affordable single family home. And so this was rapidly changing the, the nature of the, of the neighborhood that I, that I lived in. And I started to see these, these towers as these warnings or, or beacons of, of change. And then, so in this piece, it was actually in, first installed with the city of Seattle. It was kind of this, this great irony. The Office of Arts and Culture was um, commissioning a work in their gallery space that was criticizing the practices of uh, this, this unchecked development where these are all being signed off by the offices in that building. And it started with one, which was the asterisk, the idea of like the unknown, something else is coming next. And then over the span of a couple of weeks, they, they built and like more and more icons came up and we have, you know, references to like stocks raising and greed and inequality and religion. And as I was thinking about this piece in the context of Montana, like outside of where, where I'm from, like the, our dialogue, I realized that it still had a lot of relevance here, and its relevance actually stretched through more, more time, um, which is why I've included the, I think it's about a seven-foot tower of buffalo skulls that you see through the piece to think about tying together a history. Um, there were over 300,000, 300 million uh, buffalo in, in the Plains region, and 270 million were slaughtered for the sole purposes of um, expansion, Western expansion. They were slaughtered to starve out um, Native populations, to make their traditional ways of living unsustainable, and to make way for the railroad systems. And thinking about the way people see a space that someone else has that they want, decide that though that the people there are no longer worthy of that space, they're going to remove them and replace them with a new community, is something that has been continuous in our colonial history. And I wanted this piece to really draw together part of that trajectory. Um, the next piece is uh, the Unveiling the Romantic West. And these uh, five panels are, um, they're essentially black and white replicas of the packs of murals that are at the um, 
Missoula County Courthouse. Um, this piece was developed for the MAM um, in conversation, uh, like, kind of like looking back at some of the works I've been looking at, um, reinterpreting art historical work with a, a critical lens attached to it. And um, when we first started talking about this work, I thought it was a really great opportunity to start to um, dismantle and look at some of these very romantic, one-sided depictions of Western expansion. Now, these um, panels depict approximately 90 years of history from, um, I think, did we? We did we do chronological? No, actually we mimicked the installation in the, the courthouse. So um, the first image is of Lewis and Clark encountering uh, the Salish people. Um, the, in this representation, the Salish have come across Lewis and Clark's encampment. Um, however, the records uh, suggest the opposite. Um, the land, uh, there are, um, first-person accounts that have been passed down through the Salish tribe that are recorded in a book that they put out um, that talks about the, the space where this, this first interaction took place would have been being used for um, processing um, like choke cherries and, and roots. And so there would have been thousands of people encamped in this space and eight, straggler, eight stragglers wandered up to them, looking lost, disheveled, um, undersupplied. And so they offered, um, believing them to be a defeated war party, um, they offered them food, clothing, um, all kinds of gifts to, to help them through, through their, their trial as, as, they, as they saw that interaction. They were not aware that they were sent by the Hudson Bay Company as a um, scouting crew to, to find lands and resources to exploit. Um, in the uh, panel to its left, um, we have uh, Lewis and Clark fording the river as they're about to leave. Um, so within these images, I'm using a process with Thermochrom thermochromic ink. And so while I've on the surface replicated the um, packs and murals faithfully, um, hidden within some of the larger black areas are additional um, commentary and details on these, the, the histories depicted in these panels. And so in the fording of the river, if you place your hand in the back trees, you'll see some roads and buffalo because this was one of the um, historic access points to, to hunting. They, they called it the Buffalo Road. Um, underneath um, Meriwether's hand, you'll see um, a depiction of a fetus because they left behind um, babies. Um, so there are uh, direct descendants from Clark in the uh, Salish Kootenai tribe who also kept his last name. Um, and as well as some depictions of um, the plants that would have been gathered in that region um, and some references to the opium that the uh, expedition brought with them um, during uh, one of the things I looked at to kind of explore more of these histories um, was also the the journals of Lewis and Clark's so they talked there's a, a lot of written about this day and how miserable they all were from the <laughs> mosquitoes and people were really sick and uncomfortable and so at night, they all did a bunch of opium to feel better. But it's an interesting detail on like the things that they brought with them. So we have the contrast of um, the, the bitter root flowers on one side, and you can unveil like the poppies across on the other. Um, and then I think the next we have chronologically is um, their first meeting with um, Ravelli, and he's negotiating a location for the mission. And um, so hidden within this image of these men meeting are details about what they thought about each other. Um, in uh, the Salish Kootenai's accounts in the, the, the book that I was, I was mentioning earlier, they talked about um, th there being a lot of openness to um, accept new religious practices. Um, 
However, there, the misunderstanding was that they were expected to abandon their own and Ravelli, as opposed to respecting and wanting to enlighten them, um, considered them s satanic. And so there are um, different cues to those, ki those kinds of um, hidden and future conflicts hidden within, within that piece. Um, our second to last chronological piece is the um, square piece behind, which depicts the Hell's Gate Treaty. And within this piece, we have um, references to the treaty rights that were um, covered that are, that are hidden within the, 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 tree, the canopy of the trees, as well as references to um, uh, documented parts of their conversation where um, when some of the tribal le leaders did not want to sign, um, they thought that calling uh, him a dog and a woman and um, threatening him would get him to comply. Um, there was not a, tran there, there, the records of translation was that there was very poor and there was a lot of miscommunication. So he probably didn't know what he was being called names, but he was being screamed at. Um, not everyone signed. Um, and later, the final signature was, was um, forged. Um, we also have in this picture a uh, coyote hiding in the trees, um, the figure of mischief kind of watch, watching in the background. And our last panel is de depicting the um, Salus ex expulsion from the Bitterroot Valley. And in this depiction, we see like the men charging on horseback, the youth kind of celebrating in the background. They have their arms raised, and they're, they're playing on their ponies. Um, however, uh, the, there, was, there were few horses, and something that is omitted from this original image, but you can uh, find um, in a lair under the bushes on the left side, is the armed guard escort that was forcing them from, from the valley. Um, you can also erase the celebrating youth and uncover uh, the location, which is Stevens Aven current Stevens Avenue. Um, and then we also have uh, references to the bison in this piece as well, as this space was being cleared out of, of bison for the railroad. Um, and then this, the last piece I'm going to talk a little bit about is the Coyote Now series, which is behind us. Um, this series was inspired as I was reading um, Morning Dove's records of traditional coyote stories from the, the Kettle Falls. She is a um, kind of a recorder of stories from Plateau lore from the region of um, my tribal affiliation. And as I was reading through her collection of coyote stories, there was also, um, I became fascinated with the annotations. Um, I, I was so excited about reading these like footnotes. <laughs> and one, one, some of the really, there's really interesting things, including this um, idea that um, while there are ritualized coyote stories that are told the same way and are told at certain times of year, special occasions, there are also ones that are intended to be told like live and in the moment. And so there are records of early stories where a coyote is um, preparing uh, moss that he uses a microwave oven because that's what people at the time, were, they were no longer needing to make pit fires to process. They had microwaves. And so coyote was keeping up with this for a certain period of time. And um, that idea of telling, telling a story in the now was uh, something that really resonated with me. And it made me think about, well, if coyote, um, the way that coyote functioned in these stories as he's explaining the world and like, kind of like that value of what you can get from imaginative storytelling outside of purely um, scientific or fact-based story storytelling is really rich and it can really bring, put a mirror on us. And Coyote as a figure of mischief often models mistakes so that we, he can experience the consequences and we can attempt to choose better for ourselves. 
And so I started thinking in that context, what has Coyote been up to um, since we last heard about him learning about microwaves till now? And so I thought, I, I thought about um, these things that um, sometimes we question our responsibility on. And so in this panel, we have uh, Coyote uh, is in the sweat lodge. And he has bribed his frenemy, the mouse, to bring his hot rocks. So they bring in the hot rock, and they take a, take a slice of cheese. And he, he gets really hot, and he decides he's done. But he, the system that he set up to feed his, his, his greedy desire, it doesn't go away when he decides that he doesn't need it anymore, that he's done. They, the rocks continue to come and come. And so in the last panel, we have um, the newscaster uh, telling us that temperatures are continuing to rise, scientists are baffled by a persistent global warming. So there's the, the question on climate change and is it our doing? And we're, here we're kind of looking at some of the behaviors Coyote uh, exhibits that mirror our, in, our industrial and, uh, practices. And um, he gets to reflect our, our feelings of responsibility. Um, similarly, in the, the last panel, we have Coyote fighting with his uh, wife, the mole, who they're, who knows why they married, but they don't particularly get along. Um, he's often, they're fighting, she's running away, he tries to kill her pretty often. Um, <laughs> We, we're, we, in, in the participation, we can see that they, they, they maybe have different political views. Um, <laughs> so, but they, they get into a fight, and he, he, he goes after her, and she starts tunneling. And she's tunneling and tunneling. Every time she comes out, he's there leaping after her again. And eventually, um, all of that undermining of the ground causes a massive sinkhole. So maybe it's not fracking. Maybe that's not making the sinkholes like they say. Maybe it's just coyote and, and mole in a really epic battle. <laughs> um, and then we also have a, a, a few more, a little, a, little, a little simpler personal stories um, that coyote addicted to technology. This is maybe me a little reflecting myself. He, he starts he, on his commute. He's got his, his laptop and headphones on, on his computer all throughout his work day. His uh, friend of me, the mouse, is turning back the clock. A little nod to their um, relationship there. And then even in bed, he's still on the computer, but he's starting to think about, uh, you can tell from his reading materials, he's starting to think about trying to, to get away from it. He just really wants to reconnect with nature. Um, but in the end, we see him on his camping trip. But um, he's, it's set aside for now, but he still has his iPad. <laughs> um, and then the first piece was developed for, uh, for the uh, Missoula Art Museum as well. Um, and I was looking at kind of some mysteries in, in Missoula's history and thinking like, you know, if Coyote was, was busy here, what are some of the things that he could have had his hand in? And so here I've imagined Coyote as an artist. He's He's an anti-war, um, pretty, pretty serious political artist. That's why he has a beret. Um, <laughs> and he's, he's plotting, plotting what he's, what he's going to do, how he's going to use his art to talk about that. And you see him get the idea. The peace signs are reflected in his eyes. He's, he's got his plan. We see him clandestinely graffitiing and, at night. And, um, and in, in the last slide, we, we have... Uh, uh, coyote um, making the, the infamous uh, peace sign. <laughs> um, and then part of the interactivity of this piece is also based on another um, specific uh, anecdote from uh, Morning Dove's descriptions of Coyote, and which is that Coyote is immortal. Um, a full Coyote epic is to begin with his resurrection and end with his, his death. Now, because he gets in so much trouble, it's, it's inevitable he's going to bite the dust sometimes, which is why he has the ability to be, if any scrap of fo uh, fur or bone or whisker survives, that he can be brought back. And so I wanted to think about that 
method of his immortality, the remains, as being a metaphor. And so paired with these vignettes, um, we have crayons cast into the shape of coyote bones. And so we're thinking about creativity as being the way that he becomes immortal. As long as we're continuing to create with Coyote, and as long as we're continuing to create his adventures, that he, he, cannot, he cannot die. Um, and so I think that kind of covers like, the ideas presented in these works. Um, is there any questions or anything anyone wants to share from their responses? Could you talk a little bit about uh, the Hudson Bay Company? Because, of course, I grew up on the thing about Jefferson and how, how excited he was to have this, the Lewis and Clark expedition and so forth. And how did that? Yeah. Um, one of the things I really wanted to look at within um, addressing these pieces is that there is one history and one narrative that is taught. And I was taught, as many school children were, that this was an expedition of discovery. That the purpose was to find out what, how things connected, what was out there, how do we get to the water, and to find these, these ways of, of crossing the space. And I was never taught that this was a uh, commercial expedition that was for the sole purpose of finding resources to take. And that, um, this was spawn that these, these were not explorers, Lewis and Clark, they were company men. And they had very specific goals in mind with, with that expedition. And they were reporting back and that the treaties that followed to take these, these resource-rich lands were in direct connection to their initial goals. And that, that those things, while presented as being very separate in this master narrative, were actually um, very, very linear and, and planned in conjunction with each other. So that's, that's why I really wanted to bring in multiple references to the Hudson Bay Company and in the last side, we have Lolo Mountain, which the Hudson Bay Company named. Um, and so we, I also plastered their logo on the side of the mountain as a reference to their claim as well. Why don't you show some of that so they can see how, how it works? Oops. What are we Sorry. You're tethered. <laughs> Escort? No, that is that is actually a reference to the reenactment. There's the Oh yeah. Oh yes. Yeah, they got the Hudson Bay Company logo there. Um, that is a reference to the reenactment of the march. So this was a 51 mile forced march that took place over three days with women and children on foot. The horses are not an accurate depiction, nor is it an accurate depiction of the like carts because they were told to leave everything and that everything was set up on the other side, which was, of course, something that you tell somebody when you want them to march 51 miles somewhere else. That was not the case. And so, yeah, so you're, you're uncovering, like, the railroads, which was a, a huge um, factor on, on why, why it, was, it was so important for... Move. Yeah, for people to be removed was 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 the motivation had was tied directly to the railroads. And Brandon's about to uncover some maps that show 
traditional territories paired with um, reservation lines over the top. How did you discover this paint? <laughs> um, so it's just the cool stuff. My, my first, um, the first time I ever saw, saw this material, was it was actually being used on an album. So it was a box set, and it was, I think it was Massive Attack. And it was from the 80s or 90s. And um, you, you, you know, you touch it and your hands would show. Um, it's used in a variety of, of some commercial purposes. Um, the company I got this from uh, uses it on motorcycle gear. Oh. And they actually were really excited that it was going to be used for an art project. And they, they worked with me to develop this very specific temperature. Um, so it was hard for me to test because I have ice cold yeah, hands. Oh my god. <laughs> um, so it was, yeah, Tyvek. it was Tyvek. Yeah. So it's, it's very sensitive to what temperature that so these actually activate at 71.6 degrees. Oh. And so we're in a climate controlled room. So that works. But in Florida, it would be. In Florida, it would be clear all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. Yeah. yeah, unless it was in like constant air conditioning. <laughs> Yeah, I did a piece recently where I was um, redacting a map of all of the uh, Indian boarding schools in the U.S. And as I was placing them to map them, um, I had a hair dryer. <laughs> and I was like, to, 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 to find the names. Yep. Yeah. Wow. The historic uh, Paxson awesome. home is also on Stevens Avenue. Oh, exactly. Oh, that's right. <clears throat> so when I initially saw this, I hadn't realized that the, the route uh, of the of the yeah, extraction was across yeah. Stevens. So it's shocking to me how this romantic image <coughs> has been has been superimposed over over the reality because we actually have first the eyewitness testimonies mm -hmm. of what this really looked like and and how deplorable and how um, abused the individuals were who were making this journey. So it's really to walk by it in the courthouse every every day yeah. is one thing, yeah, and to see that, it, and I I love the super the, how you've superimposed the reality check, but how it's also the same way it was in the treaty signing. It was hidden. Everything in the treaty signing was hidden, in so many ways. There were so many ways it was deceptive, um, on on multiple levels, including the survey that was never conducted. And then later, um, the same. It's fascinating. It's beautiful. You mentioned a book yesterday at the courthouse, and I didn't get it. Um, the it's uh, the Salish people and the Lewis and Clark expedition. Oh, okay. And um, so when when working on this project, um, I I looked at both the uh, courthouses commissioned essays on like what the content was in each of these pieces, and then I, I dug into other sources. So that that book was one of my primary sources for um, records of like what the additional histories from the, an indigenous perspective on like what was happening in these snippets of history. Like what are the what are the things that are being excluded from this narrative? And that book also is very interested in thinking in uh, a span of time. So a lot of times people consider history contact. And then there's prehistory before that. And it's like, well, we're just not gonna talk about that. But there's, you know, at, before like that the point of that contact, there's you know, 30,000 years of historic use of this space. And so these spaces weren't just, um, they had identities and purposes and cultural practices and, and uh, food practices all existing within this space prior to these singular events that are being depicted. So I wanted to include references to those as well. And then I also looked at um, Lewis and Clark's actual diaries. Because I was able to find, um, for a, several of these, I was able to find records from the day and compare uh, their perspectives to the oral histories that have been recorded by the Salish people. And also to just add some things that um, the Paxson didn't, didn't include from, from their records. And, um, there's also, I also used uh, the missions like app website and their history of uh, Ravelli to add details about his personal life in, in that depiction as well. You know, I also found it interesting to add a few and also about uh, 
I think when you were installing and giving a talk, you were talking about the different family, the different generations depicted between the pieces. I found that really interesting. Too. Yeah. So uh, these are depicting approximately uh, 90 years of history, and there are multiple generations of tribal leadership depicted within them. And so in the first one, um, uh, three eagles was present. And then um, in the treaty, it's Chief Victor. And then in the expulsion, it's his son, uh, Chief Charlo. And um, I, 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 saw, um, I saw records that it was, there was much more conversation about um, Victor and Charlo, like Victor being Charlo's father. But in, in one of my references, I saw that the three eagle was, uh, was Victor's father. So it would be th three generations. Ryan, I'm curious, did you, did you come to interactivity as a strategy fairly early on uh, when you were starting, starting to make art? And, and do you see your, the pieces that you're doing in the public sphere, like murals and uh, public, public pieces, as a, even though they're not strictly uh, interactive as the pieces, do you, do you feel like that's an extension of that interactivity? I do. Um, so before working with direct interactivity, I started working with action. And sometimes that action would be completed by me. And so I think the first one, I, the, I made a, a large um, wall installation on domestic violence that mimicked um, Sudoku. And instead of using numbers, I uh, printed, uh, I printed out images of domestication, oppression, and submission, and then organized them um, in a way that both replicated like, um, like flesh and a and a body in, in its coloring, but also a Sudoku board with all of the um, symbols. And so in that case, I enacted. Um, putting together that piece as I installed it. Um, and then as I continued to think about materiality and action as supporting content, I started to open that to um, participation from the audience. And I think the first piece that really reflects the way I use interactivity now was my, uh, my BFA uh, thesis piece, which was um, A Little Color in the White House. And it was made, as you might imagine, during the uh, run-up to the 2008 election. And um, it actually, I was making it during the election, and it was exhibited after the inauguration. And it was a three-quarter scale replica of the White House State Dining Room. And it was from, like, everything, f as many details as I could find from, like, the, the drapes, the pattern on the drapes, to the crown, the crown molding used and paintings in the room were all replicated as a coloring book. And then I cast a feast in crayon. And the feast was comprised of both um, delicacies, like oysters and uh, roast meats but also like some down home, just like chopped carrots and beans. And um, part, some of them had bites taken out of them. Some of them had mold growing on them. And um, were they cast crayon as well? Yeah, they were, they were all in cast crayon. I remember that piece. Kids, tr kids did try to eat them. <laughs> uh, but so they were, they were set across the table. And then uh, the audience was invited to color in the piece. And it was this, it was a feast of leftovers. And I was kind of thinking about like the mess left behind and the invitation to think about yourself as having the potential to be an actor in your, in your government and in your, in your space. And it was also a question of like, what were them people going to do? Were they going to color in the piece of the coloring book? Were they going to tag it? Were they going to use it as a political forum, as you see happening with the coyote <laughs> pieces? And so a lot of the uh, interactivity and art there was like what the audience then did with that space. And uh, That's something we've really struggled with here at the Missoula Art Museum mm. is uh, 
the unpredictability of what you as the as the creators of this piece or these pieces are going to do and we've seen all sorts of really interesting ways that people interact and some sometimes we you know we've kind of tried to figure out a way to guide people uh, for appropriate ways of touching <laughs> so that they're not rubbing and you know doing slapping we've seen a lot of slapping and rubbing and, you know things like that so it's really that that idea of audience uh, unpredictability visitor unpredictability they've got something to say and they're going to figure out how to say it the best way yeah. that they can has been um, a really interesting evolution and I'm Wondering, how do you deal with that? How do you, you can't really account for it uh, yeah. necessarily. Um, so I'll give you an example of one of the ways I've dealt with it. Okay. Um, this piece, the first iteration, was hand drawn. Mm. And it was, it, was, it was hard. It was heartbreaking. It was it, <laughs> actually the, 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 the little color in the White House, that was hand drawn over, um, it was hand inked over. I had printed out like the kind of like outlines of it. Um, the next piece was purely hand drawn, and I was like, I am never doing that again. <laughs> because even though I knew better, I started to hope that they turned out pretty. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this, I'm like so excited to see like how beautiful, because they were so beautiful as just drawings. I was like, I'm so excited to see how beautiful they're going to be. They have such potential. <laughs> and you know, and you know, when you invite in a public, you never know what that process is going to be. And I always now think of my interactive works as being consumable and we kind of discussed that with these pieces and as we were planning how we were our you know our business relationship on these pieces and is that they are made for this and it's completely possible that they will be totally consumed by this event and so these pieces are all cut vinyl on mat board so they are reproducible, easily reproducible. They're all in files on my computer. Um, I can entirely let go and not have any expectations about what they're going to look like at the end. Um, there are some right now that I'm, I very much love how they're turning out. But I also understand that like, when I collect them in a couple more months, that's probably not going to be the case anymore. <laughs> um, you have to stay detached. But it's, it's also back to that, that idea about like indigenous methodology on art making, is that it's not the product that is the art. It's not this like special, beautiful thing that you get to, to look at or collect. It is what it is doing in a community and cultural space. And so it's okay that they, that they, 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 that they don't live forever, that they might get destroyed, because their, their purpose is in being with people and being participated with people. It's not in making a thing. Can you, can you imagine what you do to the curators? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is the um, paper that you've drawn on here? So these are on Tyvek. Um, so very much in line with um, talking about a piece that is intended that you know, I was aware that people might be pushing and scratching. Uh, Tyvek is traditionally used to cover buildings to protect them from weather while they're being constructed. Oh, and you see it written on them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or in like in like or in very strong envelope material, and so you can order it blank from them. And so this is a very uh, sturdy paper-like fabric-like material it's that's made from like composite plastic. And theoretically, I mean, there wasn't, the crayons were a little hard to remove, but I also imagine like not all hands are going to be clean. Um, this material can then also be washed. Sometimes they make shower curtains out of it too because it's very uh, water resistant. And hiking gear and those overalls you buy when you're, you want to paint in your house and not get anything on your clothes, those are all tie back as well. But Ryan's use of it as a, as a building material, I think, is almost an extension off of the disconnected towers and kind mm. of uh, some sort of a commentary on, on land use and development kind of but very subtly unless you know it's a building material those associations don't present themselves. So that's T-Y-V-E-K? Mm-hmm. Do you have a comment? So I had a question. I, I've been grappling lately in my conversations with Julie with the 
um, cultural value of reciprocity. And mm. when I see your installations, I see manifestations of that. Could you talk about the degree to which the people who interact with your work are co-authors, and there's a give and take that occurs um, in the process? Just yeah, um, so all, all of the work I make is very direct and deliberate in its purpose. The, um, the interactivity and the layered meanings and, meta and metaphors are intended to invite people to think um, about a, a, a subject, particularly things that involve cognitive dissonance. And, um, you know, I, I spent my younger years making some maybe more abrupt or confrontational works. And um, I feel like in order for people to actually make a personal dis decision or change, that it needs to come from them and not from me telling them. And so I see myself as making opportunities for other people to think about things. And I don't need them to, to co-author or necessarily reciprocate unless they're uh, helping complete a metaphor. In, in the case of some of the public artworks I've done, the participation becomes very important to that. But um, I like to think that I'm providing something and not necessarily doing something in order to make a reciprocal relationship. So they're not really co-artists? Yeah. I'm more formatting an experience that I'm offering. They have a chance. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> well, that's probably a good note to end on. We've come to our, our noon hour, and Ryan is getting ready for an afternoon workshop. So I just wanted to thank you all for coming and participating in this conversation. And can we thank Ryan for coming from Seattle and presenting her artwork? Thank you.